the title of the session is Applications of CAD, CAM, CIE in uh, Mechanical Engineering. The speaker is uh, Dr. Amrita Priyadarshini. Presently, she is working for uh, Bits Pilani Hyderabad campus. Professor Amrita Priyadarshini received her uh, doctoral degree from the Department of Mechanical Engineering from IIT Kharagpur in the year 2012. Her research interest lies in the area of machinability studies, material characterization, surface coating, finite element analysis, and optimization of machines and other manufacturing processes. Currently, she is working as associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Bits Pilani Hyderabad campus. She has published in various journals and conferences of um, international reputed. So far, one scholar has completed PhD under her supervision. She has one ongoing research, uh, research project as principal investigator funded by um, DRDO and is uh, a and she's supervising two more PhD scholars, uh, one in the area of machining while other in the area of uh, mechanical alloying and surface coating. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for introducing me. I'm really sorry I got delayed. I think there was some issue with my tab. I could not connect. Anyways, I'll go ahead. Uh, so I'll just uh, share the PPT. I hope my PPT is visible, sir. Yes, ma'am. We are able to see. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So very good morning to all of you. And welcome to uh, today's uh, second day session. So as we all know, this topic is something related to emerging trends and technical development in uh, automated machines. So basically, my session deals with the overview of uh, related to what all emerging things have come up in mechanical engineering. And to be more specific, it is something related to manufacturing. So how these application of computers like CAD, CAM, CA, uh, what is the need of having these things in manufacturing and how the progress has happened? And currently, what is the latest trend which is going on? And this helps us in keeping us updated so that uh, every time there is a scope of improvement. And finally, our objective is whatever the demand is, uh, the uh, demand should be the customer's requirement and the demand should be met from our end. So this is how I am going to start. This is what is uh, basically the talk is all about. And since sir has already introduced me, so I am Amrita Priyadashini and I am working in Bitspilani Hyderabad campus from almost uh, uh, eight years here after doing my PhD. So if we see just to start with, because as I said, uh, we are basically trying to understand what are the recent advances or emerging trends, or in my case, application of uh, CAD, CAM, or computers in general in manufacturing. So first thing what comes is like, uh, what is the importance of manufacturing for, uh, for any country? So this is just to give a brief idea, like uh, how the world economy is, and you can see like uh, how uh, like uh, how these uh, developed countries uh, how they have progressed and uh, what are their share in globally how their share is so what we can see is if we are far ahead in manufacturing that's a very uh, important point which we have to think of obviously there is service industries also but for even to support service industries manufacturing is something that is really very important so now if you see china so they are like one of the if you see the share and if we compare with uh, sorry. Uh, if we compare with uh, the overall um, uh, globally how the share is for them with respect to manufacturing so they are, they are like almost uh, uh, at a very high um, uh, at a very uh, higher range but if we see like india is still we are still in a phase where we are trying to uh, grow up in that particular area and that could be one of the reasons where uh, there are a lot of initiatives also coming into our country like make in india and these things because if it's not only about uh, uh, like manufacture i mean uh, having those updated products is also about how we are manufacturing those things how to adopt those new technologies and then go ahead so that is how we have to be very much, it's very important to know what are the latest trends going on. And based on that, we have to adopt those things. And finally, we should be self-sustained. Not everything we have to bring it from outside. So if we are self-sustained, obviously, we will be creating more employment. And uh, we can uh, reduce the cost for most of the things. So that is how now for that, we require those technologies. We have to understand the updated technologies and try to adopt those things in our processes. 
so that is how manufacturing is important for any uh, nations um, uh, for any uh, nation to grow manufacturing is one of the important sectors where we have to actually look upon if we see when we are talking about manufacturing if we see there are so many products like if we just take some 20 years not even more than that if you see in these 20 years there are so many products coming and going or maybe you can see there are products which are evolving if you just look at these um, So if we just look at, look at these particular components, so some 20, 25 years back that it was a breakthrough kind of technology like mobile phones. That was like, as the name was mobile phone, it was basically wherever you are, you are actually able to call. But now that particular thing has the definition of the mobile phones have completely changed. And in fact, we call it as a smartphone. So you can see how over these 20, 25 years itself, just for this particular product, how the things have evolved. So uh, with the demand, with the technology improvement, so th now the definition for phone itself has changed. So making a call is just a default feature for a phone, but we look for other things uh, for when we are purchasing these products. And if, like for example, Nokia, so this was one of the, uh, these are the models which initially started with. But now if you see, there are so many, there are after gradually, then when this came, there are so many competitors coming up. And what happened is, as the technology is improving, people's demand is changing. So if you see nowadays, there is hardly any Nokia phone in use. Why? Because they lacked whatever the updates, whatever the demand is coming, they could not foresee it. And that's the reason now it has completely lost its market. So that is how there are a lot of, uh, so this, why I'm discussing this, because this, just by looking at the product itself, you can see how there are different uh, changes happening throughout in the development. So in fact, those changes, how we are making these products, so that basically is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, every time a phase is coming and we are trying to bring some revolution. So that is how this term, industrial revolution, come into picture, right? So everybody knows about this industrial revolution. So how we have progressed from first industrial revolution and now it's like the fourth one. And if you see the products, there are many products like these uh, audio cassettes. So there was a time we were completely, I mean, this was at the peak. And then gradually as the technology changed, so now there are no, uh, we are not using those kind of Walkmans or those kind of tape recorders. So or, or completely the technology has changed and we cannot, uh, now these uh, cassettes are no further used. Similarly, cameras. So now for camera, there was a camera with a roll, then came digicams that became more handy. And now, now we are hardly using digicams all because now smartphones have taken the market. So that is how the progress is happening. For Internet Explorer, now uh, some 20 years back, this was the one which we used, uh, which we were using. But now I feel hardly we use this. Now Chrome has taken the market. So how these things are happening? Because every time the way the technology update is happening they are trying to align with that they are trying to align themselves with the customer's requirement and the demand so that is how we have to every time be aligned with whatever is coming up and we have to be updated whatever technology developments are there we need to adapt to those things so that is what is um, the progress we started with the first industrial revolution where like initially before industrial revolution came as the name says revolution so every phase we are bringing some revolution we are bringing some changes okay so initially it was like when we um, uh, it was like everything was uh, was to be done by um, by us then gradually what we did is we tried to make use of uh, machines to simplify our life so that is mechanization and then uh, the uh, when we are trying to uh, run a machine, we require some sort of power and the breakthrough was steam power. Then after 50 years, gradually the first led to the second one, where now already we know how to use the machines. Okay, so machines are making our life simple. There are a lot of things which we were doing by hand. So that is now being used by machines. Then gradually it uh, went uh, towards mass production, assembly line, uh, assembly line kind of thing like uh, the uh, the first one which uh, took over this like Ford. So they started uh, uh, manufacturing cars where this assembly line kind of concept came up, mass production came up. And one more important thing, one more breakthrough was electrical power. Now electricity was being used. So you can see one revolution is actually leading to the second one. So whatever we are doing, again, we are trying to look forward out of the box. What else can be done to improve? 
further. If we are not looking that, then we could not have reached till this, uh, this particular phase. So in mass production, now there are many uh, things which, uh, which basically came up. If you uh, think like when we say mass production, there are few terms immediately comes in standardization, uh, interchangeability. Right? So these are some of the things. And when we focus on mass production, obviously the per unit cost can be reduced. So that is how there are some important things which came up in the second phase. So now here, uh, so in mass production, basically what we are uh, trying to focus is maybe the product, the uh, components which are we are trying to standardize. So those components can be used. Uh, it can be applied or uh, it can have applications in many other final products. So those things can be standardized. And accordingly, you start producing in bulk. Okay, so that is how interchangeability and standardization. These are some of the, uh, some of the keywords which came in when we uh, came into mass production. And then gradually what we entered into is digitalization and automation. So now this entire um, theme for this particular conference is also something related to this. Now we are already knowing how to use the machine and then how to make the entire process to, pr to produce the standardized components. So when uh, we are producing in bulk, and uh, we are targeting for some standard products. So why not to go for automation? Because uh, when automation means what? Where you are trying to reduce the human intervention and you are trying to make something uh, where the machine is following some predefined instructions and with very less human intervention, it can be done. So in that, what happens? Efficiency increases, accuracy increases. And uh, that is the way the third thing came into picture. So along with that, digitalization also came into picture. So what is this digitalization? So now automation is something where you are trying to automate the things. OK, these are the products to be done. We know these are the uh, steps to be followed. So why not to automate it and get the things out? So with very less human intervention, we can do it. And the things will be quite faster. Uh, so here, digitalization means here gradually the uh, introduction of computers already started coming in here. So that is digitalization. So now from this, we are now entering further into the fourth industrial revolution. That is what it is called as Industry 4.0, where we are now going one step ahead. So it's something like um, cyber physical systems are the main focus of this, where we are trying to interact between the virtual, uh, trying to interact with the physical thing, with the virtual thing. So here it's more about exchanging the data on the internet and uh, how to manage those data, how to analyze those data, and then train it and go for uh, further improvement in the process. So this is something is coming in the uh, industry 4.0. So this is the overall uh, thing, like the way we have progressed. In fact, you, if you see in this particular um, uh, in this um, program, so there are all uh, individual sessions dealing with these things. So in my thing, I'm just trying to relate how these things are coming together and uh, just overall overview of each and every aspect. So this is the overview of uh, like what I'm saying is from the third revolution itself, we can see digitization and automation. So when we say digitization and automation, so computer, use of computers is one of the critical things without which we cannot do these things. So that is how this is the uh, upcoming trends like uh, the things which we'll, I'll be just briefly touching. So obviously, when we say uh, digitization and automation, the first thing that come into mind is CNC. Then 3D printing is something which has now taken over uh, from past, uh, let's say, 20 years. This has come up. Then micro manufacturing, automation, biomedical. Then we have CAD. Then uh, AR and VR simulations, IoT, which is like a very buzzword nowadays for industry 4.0, machine learning. So machine learning, so you can see basically how we have progressed and what is the uh, need of the uh, current, uh, what is the current need. So these are the things which we have to know if we want to be aligned with what the revolution is happening. So in the third, uh, certainly the automation and digitalization came means computers. CNCs are one of the important breakthrough that came in. And nowadays, and with the help of these computer assisted, we have a lot of other things which are coming. And that is uh, part of this is going into this industry 4.0 as well. So we will be just touching these topics one by one.
so coming to cnc so cnc uh, like um, everyone uh, nowadays know what cnc is it's a numerical uh, uh, computer numerical control machines okay and uh, basically earlier it was uh, cncs it is uh, like what is the benefit of having cncs earlier we had lathe milling machine drilling machine let's say i'm uh, talking about the machining operation we had already existing we have these machines like uh, lathe milling drilling but they uh, their the uh, motions are uh, basically controlled manually and in that case what happens is human intervention is more and when there is human intervention is there accuracy will be obviously less repeatability will be also less but if you want to have more towards uh, and again the since the uh, the standard machines which were used they were mostly like three axis machines so in that way uh, generating complex structured things will be also very difficult nowadays if you see there are so many uh, the application is like wide so where we require uh, very complex structures as well uh, complex contours are required so just thinking in a normal conventional lathe it becomes very difficult because they have lot of limitations in that so there is again human skill is involved in that but again getting that uh, very uh, with a very tight tolerance and those complex uh, structures becomes very difficult so that is how cncs came into picture so one is th one is that it is um, uh, it will give you complex structures and accuracy will be very high because hum human intervention is not there complex structures because it has more flexibility in terms of the uh, degree of freedom so you get uh, more uh, so there are five axis machines six axis machines so there are like uh, improvements in this so here uh, that is how the uh, that is how the need is looking at the current need so cncs have almost taken up the market so if even if our normal research what we are doing we make use of cncs so here we have a better control on the process parameters we can go for um, highly complex structures and it's uh, flexible also like if you want to do some changes in the actual component so basically you have to do some changes in the part programming itself so that is how it is so it is something related to flexible manufacturing as well so now uh, one thing what we heard, uh, uh, what we heard is about automation where automation means it is something they are following the predefined uh, sequence of instructions so that is mostly suitable for uh, mass production and bulk production but there are also uh, the demand where everything uh, cannot be like uh, a standard product there could be some customized products also in fact nowadays what we are trying to um, uh, trying to do is uh, kind of mass customization so mass production was one thing now if you see in operations they are trying to target more towards mass customization so where you have customized product also and you are able to produce in bulk as well so this is a combination of all the approaches together so here when it is a customization when the product has to be customized then your overall setup should be flexible enough to adapt those uh, customization so if you just look at the uh, normal fixed automation kind of thing where what happens is if you want to do any changes in the product then you have to do changes in the entire setup but here cncs are quite flexible so here whatever changes you want to do on a part component on a part so you have to actually do the changes in the part programming so that is how it comes under flexible manufacturing also so here when we look at cncs so there are uh, some important things so first thing is the foundation like where uh, we have to uh, basically understand like what are the basic components involved okay so what are the different uh, motions that can be done so one is related to hardware like how the overall machine setup is to understand that so it's not only about using the machines so when it's also about understanding the overall uh, uh, machine setup because once we understand the things because as i already said uh, we uh, for any nation manufacturing means it's not about manufacturing the products we have to also look how we are manufacturing is how how we are able to develop those uh, machines also it's not like we are importing the machines and manufacturing we should be also in a position to uh, develop or manufacture those machines also so in that way the first thing is that to understand the overall setup what are the various basic components how the uh, what are the various fixtures what are the different motions involved so first we need to understand that and for this uh, and then what we require is a part program i think one one session was there uh, 
uh, yesterday, it seems, which was related to part programming, if I'm not wrong. So you must have already gone through that particular session. So part program is, uh, is nothing but the set of instructions, which is the first thing which we are going, which, are, which we are giving to the CNCs. Okay. And then we have to basically uh, uh, this, uh, develop this tool path. We have to go for the tool path generation. And then uh, building the, uh, the third aspect could be overall. As I said, first you need to understand the overall setup. Then you need to understand, uh, you have to uh, understand the part program, generate the tool path. And we, can, we should also focus on, um, we should also focus on the building, how the machine is built. What are the uh, what are the different uh, motions involved in that? So as a small small projects, we can actually work. So just adding one more motion. So we can go for simple uh, setups where we can convert those things, uh, the different motions to be uh, controlled by the computer. So that small one one step if we are taking. So this makes us closer towards understanding the overall setup and the technique and the technology also. So if you see here, these are the different uh, uh, different uh, softwares being used for tool path generation. So Mastercam, we have we have Power Mill, we have Creo, Edge. So these are some of the softwares which are generally used for this uh, uh, tool path uh, generation. So these are the softwares. So out of this uh, this uh, Fusion 360, this is also this Mastercam. These are very commonly used uh, softwares and readily available. Lot of materials are also available related to this. And uh, using that, uh, let's say giving some small projects to students, uh, making a part program and understanding the uh, motion, different motion systems in a CNC, and then try to come up with some uh, some uh, programming. So these are some of the things we uh, we can explore in CNC. So in CNCs, it's not only about the CNC. There are different types. So computer, wherever the computer is assisting, that becomes a CNC machine. So one uh, very commonly used is like uh, in machining operations, we have CNC uh, lathe, milling machine, uh, CNC drilling, and then we have different non-conventional like wire EDM. So that is also again assisted by computer. That is CNC. And then uh, apart from that, we have uh, other uh, things like 3D printing. So that is also something assisted by computer. So that is also kind of uh, CNC uh, based machine that is 3D printer. So next, what we will see is about 3D printing. So 3D printing now it's a very uh, commonly uh, used word and we have started exploring. So if we see what are the basic uh, steps in 3D printing. So what we have is, uh, so uh, 3D as the name says, what basically the most conventional type of uh, processes like manufacturing processes what we have is casting forming welding and machining generally for uh, complex structures one of the best uh, thing what we do is machining now what uh, happens in machining is it's a subtractive process where we remove material to get the desired shape now what is happening in 3d printing so in 3d printing actually we are not removing material we are actually building the material uh, layer by layer. So that is why 3D printing is also called as additive manufacturing. So here we are not um, removing any material, we are adding material. So if we compare with uh, the conventional machining process, again, machining is something which, which cannot be substituted by any of the processes. But still, if we just compare, there are some complex structures where when you are going for machining, uh, there are so many sophisticated machines, CNC controlled, we can do it. But thing is that, uh, every time we are removing the material. So when we remove the material, obviously there is a kind of wastage happening. In case of 3D printing, we are not removing. In fact, we are simply whatever the contour, whatever the profile is. So here with the help of, as I said, computer is one of the key role playing in this. So we, uh, with the help of uh, the uh, CAD model, so what we are doing is we are trying to build that and then we are um, uh, putting the uh, material layer by layer. So that is what is uh, uh, 3D printing. So first is about design, where your 3D model is developed using a CAD software. Okay, And then what we have to do, because it's a process where the deposition of material happens in layer. So the next important step comes is slicing. So we have to now, once you generate the CAD, uh, once you ge generate the 3D uh, model using the CAD software, then the entire model has to be uh, basically sliced entire model has to be uh, sliced in layers. Now, these layers can vary from, let's say, 0.05 mm to 0.5 mm. 
so again deciding on the layer thickness it depends upon what the component is what is the size and what is the uh, structure of the component and what is the final finish you want because all these things is going to affect your final finish uh, the strength uh, so basically so we have to decide so this is the range in which the thickness varies so we have to uh, decide on the layer thickness and that is how with the help of uh, another software uh, slicing software there are specific slicing softwares so by which we can actually uh, slice this entire model and then uh, then once we develop this particular thing so this uh, we come up with this stl file so that goes an input to the printing machine and that is how it simply follows that instruction and layer by layer it keeps on depositing the material so now how you are depositing the material based on that we have different types of 3d printing machines because we have to uh, basically deposit material so what kind of material you are depositing and how you are depositing what is that mechanism or technique by which you are depositing so based on that we have different types of 3d printing uh, machines so one of the uh, like uh, the uh, initially or now the uh, very uh, commonly used uh, uh, material is uh, polymers so polymers if you see there are a lot of work already being done and it is being um, uh, efficiently used for uh, these polymer materials and there are different techniques lot of research has already been done and uh, again in that also there is always a scope of coming up with innovative ideas and creative ideas so one area is where it is related to polymers and another is related to metals so depending upon that we have different types of uh, 3d printing processes so if we see uh, a very commonly used is fdm which is nothing but fused deposition uh, modeling so here uh, what happens is it is uh, with uh, the uh, the what is the raw material in what form the raw material is how the material is getting deposited then how the material is getting fused and how you are getting the final product based on that these classifications have been done so we have fdm uh, that is fused deposition modeling we have uh, stereolithography then uh, we have um, uh, selective laser melting or selective laser sintering then we have uh, uh, binder jet and uh, we have ebm slm so these are something related to metals and these are something related to polymers so out of this fdm is one of the most uh, commonly used you must have already uh, you you might be using these techniques also in your labs so here uh, this uh, the name says fused deposition so the starting work part is basically uh, the uh, filaments okay so here the filaments or the uh, so the raw material is in the form of filaments and these filaments they will be extruded out of the uh, nozzle okay so this nozzle is basically uh, heated and as uh, so be, uh, so as it gets extruded it gets deposited layer by layer and then what and when they are getting deposited so they are fused uh, so they are basically layer by layer they are fusing fusion uh, takes place so that is how fused deposition so this is one way of doing it and this is one of the very commonly used technique so when this uh, technique initially started so these printers now they are readily available and since now it lot of research has been done people have accepted uh, these kind of techniques so now uh, pro, uh, this uh, process uh, this uh, cost has also gone down a lot and a lot of materials have already been um, tested and being used so some of the common materials which are being used are like pla abs uh, this uh, so these are different uh, types of uh, common materials apart from that we also have uh, high strength polymers like peak so here this pla abs if you see there are uh, even in our labs also we have 3d printers and uh, commonly used material is pla and abs so these are now well within 2 lakhs 3 lakhs also you are able to purchase these kind of equipments in fact in our first year also students are uh, getting exposed to these kind of techniques where they understand okay how to um, how to make a cad model then how to do the slicing then how to uh, how to uh, make this stl file and put it in the printer and what are the process parameters which we need to play with uh, to come up with the desired finish and desired strength so these are some of the things in first year and then in mechanical third year they are trying to explore they are trying to make some small small components based on fdm so pla abs these are all commonly used materials which are like almost uh, these equipments have become standard so again as i said we have to think beyond what has been done so here there are other materials 
So for these uh, uh, equipments, uh, the temperature requirement will be less. So somewhere uh, within 250 degree, 200 or 250 degree centigrade, what it will be there. But when it is high strength, now we are trying to ex uh, extend it to high strength polymers. So in that case, the temperature has to be uh, at least around more than 400 or 450 degree centigrade. So that is how, as the material is changing, so the capability of the machine has also to be changed. It has to be fine tuned with what material you want to use. So that is how there are different models, there are different makes in which uh, they are uh, in which you can actually go for different kinds of materials so now there are equipment there are printers which can go for these high strength polymers which uh, require higher temperature so these are uh, some of the um, uh, polymer related uh, printing equipments as i said fdm so here again there are a lot of scope so as i said these are uh, standard equipments and generally what they prefer is uh, like uh, whatever the make you have taken so they will be giving you okay these are the grade or these are the materials which has to be purchased from them only so that is how they, uh, you have very little flexibility in that aspect okay so if this particular machine is meant for pla and abs this grade of material from this vendor only should be used with this specification so now what uh, what uh, basically the development is there are machines which are coming up where you can actually um, uh, you can uh, go for different uh, uh, the material the equipment is flexible enough to may uh, to use uh, materials from other specific i mean it should be other grades i mean not necessary you have to purchase from that supplier only so now that kind of flexibility is uh, also coming up so we have something called open source 3d printers so here are the the uh, names which are mentioned here so these are the um, uh, basically, the, these are the service providers which actually give uh, some training related to open source 3D printers. So 3D printers, polymer related, it's already there. What I want to say is like how to extend it beyond, like how to make this particular equipment more flexible. Like it should not be like, okay, for this material and this grade only it is being used. So there are again further developments happening. Now how you can make it as an open source so that you can go for different kinds of materials, not necessary, only this grade from this vendor has to be procured. So in that way, if you are able to uh, develop uh, printers like this, then uh, you have more flexibility in understanding the entire process. And uh, again, once you do it gradually, again, you will target for a uh, lower cost. It has to be cost effective also. So it has to be uh, what our intention is. Now, if a particular uh, technique has been accepted, then we have to think in what way we have to make it cost effective and make it more flexible. So it can be used for varied materials and not necessarily only this particular grade can be used and that's it. So in that way, one machine utilization is also uh, improving and increasing. So this is what is something related to uh, polymer uh, printing. So as I said, one of the most commonly used is uh, FDM. Apart from that, we have SLA, stereolithography. Uh, Again, there are different types of uh, printing techniques and what we have is uh, every every uh, type of printing method will has its own plus and minus. So depending upon our requirement, uh, we have to choose a particular uh, process and we have to fabricate our things. So if you see here, so generally uh, if you see here, these are some of the, um, uh, if you see this one. So there are again printers, as I said, polymer related 3D printers are available. And uh, let's say some common uh, materials like ABS, PLA, uh, these kind of printers are there. So one option is that how to uh, think, uh, one option is thinking of open source kind of 3D printer where we can go for um, uh, different materials, whatever material or whatever grade we want, we are free to use that. So that is one scope where we have to think of. Then there are also uh, developments coming up using multi-material filament because what we do is uh, what these FDM is like when you are going for ABS means the filament will be only ABS. The input is um, it is in terms of uh, filaments and it is only uh, ABS which is which is going and if the component which is coming up is ABS. Now how to now uh, the type of if you look into different applications related to aero, aerospace defense or biomedical so there are also they are uh, so people are also looking for combining two different uh, materials in one depending upon the requirement like one material is uh, uh, is having good strength 
and uh, just to uh, so in that way uh, you are trying to combine the good properties of both the materials together so those kind of uh, things are also coming up where you can come up with multi material filaments so there will be uh, two filaments like if you see here this is also kind of uh, development being happening where you have a multi nozzle extruder so as we see in our cnc machines we have turrets so here also a turret kind of thing is there where we have different uh, different filaments of different materials and you are able to with a single machine you are able to use uh, you are able to use uh, two different materials for uh, making one uh, single component so these kind of uh, things like it's not only okay now we created a printer with abs and pla and we stop it there so we have to think what further because that is how the current scenario is so if you see there are different applications in which they want uh, these uh, multi material kind of thing so if we are not going in that particular direction then this technique will become obsolete and demand for uh, these multi material kind of thing is there if we are not able to provide then gradually this thing will also become obsolete so that is how there are again in this there are different challenges so but every time we have to think of um, uh, creating or imp uh, improving how we can go one step ahead if you see here there are some uh, uh, very good journals hardware x and software x so these uh, journals actually give us one is related to the hardware so how uh, uh, like uh, this completely gives you the details of how a small equipment i mean the complete hardware details for a particular um, setup will be given so this is very uh, this uh, like as a faculty let's say when we are giving some small projects to students so we can actually refer to these um, uh, journals so uh, these gives you the complete detail one is related to hardware and another is related to software so we cannot expect like in the one step itself we'll be developing some new thing but at least repeating the things like whatever has been already done at least taking those details understanding that and developing by ourselves that itself gives a complete uh, learning experience and once we learn whatever has been done whatever is existing then only we can think of okay how to improve that so these are some of the journals which we can actually refer there are a lot of uh, uh, a lot of um, whatever the current trends are going on so all the uh, the details of that in terms of hardware or software there will be uh, so we can take up as a small module and try to develop so once we understand the overall functioning we develop it then we can think okay these are the challenges actually happening how to improve it further so how to add some further uh, modules to that okay to address this particular thing or to make it a further cost effective so ultimately these are some of the things every time we have to look for so apart from uh, polymers nowadays there is also uh, uh, the scientists have started working in 3d printing composites composites we all know what it is and composites it finds wide variety of applications so now when uh, 3d printing is one thing where it's a uh, additive uh, where the material is uh, getting built up layer by layer and here uh, the uh, because uh, here the starting part is a cad model so whatever complex structure you want so that can be created okay so the technique is like the, the technique is mainly focused for uh, complex structure or any customized uh, feature you want to add so there are a lot of uh, lot of optimization uh, like you want to do some uh, topology optimization you want to have uh, uh, some features uh, in a particular you want to uh, add weight somewhere you want to remove weight somewhere so all these things are actually possible in 3d printing and composites they have lot of uh, applications so as such there is a, we uh, we manufacture composites and there are other manufacturing processes by which we come up with um, uh, final uh, products but again when we are going for the conventional ways in composites there are uh, there are also challenges let's say uh, uh, we machine uh, we for any uh, co complex structure we go for machining of composites also but com machining composite itself is also not very easy so now what they are trying is a one step kind of approach where they are directly trying to 3d print the composite itself so where uh, composite is nothing but it's the fiber plus matrix so they are trying to come up with uh, technologies where they can um, go with this fiber and matrix combination of these two things so they are making let's say they are taking these um, uh, these um, uh, fiber filaments and then they are making into uh, they will be uh, made into uh, Uh, wires 
and there will be a matrix impregnated with that and that is how uh, the uh, the uh, development is going like mark forge if you see here so there is one equipment uh, there is one printer by mark forge so they are trying to make use they are trying to print composites directly so that is how there are different uh, applications related to it and not just we have to uh, think in terms of polymers so we have to see how these composites can be printed so this is one of the areas now upcoming areas 3d printing of composites so fiber plus matrix so how we can print it layer by layer how we are combining this fiber with matrix and printing it so that is what is uh, related to composites So this is how just uh, one technique. This is a uh, this is one of the latest techniques. If you see, uh, so there is PLA and there is carbon fiber. So how these two? So basically, designing the print head to print continuous fiber composites. So it's an open source 3D printer. So that is how open source 3D printers nowadays are uh, becoming more popular because you have a lot of flexibility, you can explore more, you can come up with a lot of innovative things, you can do a lot of process parameter changes and do the study. So open source 3D printer is something which is nowadays uh, very popular and a uh, lot of research is going on in that direction. So this is something related to 3D printing of composites. Then coming to metals. So coming to uh, metals, so one is about uh, polymer printing and now what we can see is um, uh, 3D metal printers, one of the upcoming areas. I mean already uh, there is a lot of components being printed. So we have different types like uh, selective laser melting, then uh, direct energy deposition, binder jetting and bound metal deposition. So these are different techniques which are related to uh, metals. So I think uh, you must be aware of uh, these names, what is selective uh, laser melting. So the, how the how you are depositing the material and in what form the material is getting deposited based on that, uh, this particular, uh, uh, these are classified. So when it is selective laser melting, like uh, one of the things is um, uh, uh, where uh, here the powder, the input in case of SLM, generally the power, the input will be powder. So here, like we have a powder bed and then uh, selectively so the uh, so what we do is so with the help of laser so here we require very powerful lasers so this powder is uh, so selectively so you have a powder bed and whatever the contour whatever the cad model is so following that particular uh, cad model so the selectively the laser will be focusing on those uh, contours and selectively it is getting melted and fused so that is how the excess powder, the unfused powder, basically they uh, they act as supports. And uh, what you have is uh, finally what you get is the complete um, uh, component out of that, that is selective laser melting. So selectively you are melting it and the input in this is powder. BED is something where this is also the input is powder. But here what happens is uh, with the help of laser beam, so the powder is getting melted and getting deposited. So there is a difference between SLM and DED. In case of powder bed, what happens is there is the, uh, the powder is already in the bed and you are, the laser is being focused in such a way. So selectively the melting is happening. In DED, what happens directly with the help of laser beam, directly with the help of laser beam, the powder is getting melted and getting deposited. So these, uh, uh, then we have binder jetting where it's like uh, similar to what uh, uh, we have in uh, like our uh, fuse deposition kind of thing. So here this SLM is one of the very commonly used uh, technique nowadays. But still, when we are thinking of metal 3D printers, these are very, very costly. Because uh, the polymer printing, I think all inst institutes, uh, all labs are mostly having. Why? Because now they have almost been accepted. They are becoming a standard equipment and we are able to reduce the cost. But for metals, it is being gradually introduced and these are very costly machines. Like let's say if you go for a G make uh, with a build volume just 100, 100 mm by 100 mm uh, by 100 mm. So for that itself, it, the cost will be around 2 crores with SLM. If you go for DED and if you go for higher build volume, it will be not less than 4 crores or 5 crores. So that is how the, um, the cost aspects, the, it is uh, very costly. 
even if it's very effective for some like uh, there are a lot of application in terms of biomedical especially in biomedical it is finding a lot of applications but thing is that the overall setup is very costly so here the one thing is that if you see uh, and apart from that uh, so we uh, we have to think like in what way we can uh, go for uh, making it cost effective so we have to understand the overall mechanism we have to understand the existing equipments and we have to see in what way we can develop uh, the equipments to make it cost effective because otherwise it becomes very difficult to access these kind of machines so in metal additive manufacturing i just listed out what could be the possible areas of research so if you see um, there are certain challenges still there so uh, because uh, the metal additive manufacturing is mostly for making complex structures and lightweight structures that is one of the application for which we go for metal additive manufacturing so how to achieve those complex structures how to make lightweight and then um, so that is one of the applications of metal additive manufacturing but if you see no matter whatever the technique you are using whether it is slm or ded so there are uh, challenges related to porosity and residual stresses because very high temperature is involved so here residual stresses is one of the things and these residual stresses are certainly going to affect when the component will be uh, under applications so porosity and residual stresses is one thing then we have to think in terms of strength and build time because uh, how to reduce the build time and how to increase the strength and we have to also think in terms of accuracy and quality obviously in case of uh, ded uh, uh, the quality and accuracy is certainly coming but still there will be some uh, cases where generally after going for 3d printed um, components we require a post finishing operation so is there any way that post finishing well we can uh, to some extent it can be uh, eliminated so these are some of the areas there are still challenges we have to look into it so for that like for lightweight structures so we have to uh, like what are the things we can go for we can go for topology optimization this is one area where you can go for topology optimization and then think of complex and lightweight structures then for porosity and residual stresses uh, we can focus on multi physics modeling so you can go for different uh, uh, modeling and then you can uh, think how to reduce the porosity and residual stresses then for build time and uh, strength we should focus on process optimization what are the important process parameters how to uh, how to uh, choose the select right kind of process parameters for getting higher strength lower build time then we have to go for then once you uh, make these things you have to go for material characterization then what kind of post processing is required so these are some of the areas related to metal additive manufacturing which we can think of and we can uh, uh, like we can study we can analyze so this is something related to metal additive manufacturing so next is cad uh, how much time is left sir for me yeah uh, no issue madam uh... 10 minutes more. Okay. In fact, okay. we should uh, close by 12, but it's okay if you take five more minutes. Okay, fine. So what we understood is, uh, I just gave you a very brief idea of 3D printing, like one is um, uh, polymer and another is metal. In polymer, again, uh, like uh, how to go for open source kind of 3D printers, that is one scope. And then how to extend it for composite printing, that is another area which we can look for. So that is related to uh, polymers. And also the overall equipments, what we have for uh, like multi-material or composites. So in what way we can uh, make it more flexible and we can make it cost effective. And next is metal. So now there are number of uh, like from titanium, cobalt, chrome, stainless steel. So there are different materials being 3D printed. But again, these machines which are available are very specific. Let's say a GE make. So they will be giving you the list of materials. Uh, for 3d printer and they will and you have to use only those material so in that way you don't have much flexibility as such in the current whatever equipments we have in 3d metal printers uh, so flexibility is less uh, you don't have much flexibility in terms of material and next is it's very it's highly co it's very uh, costly so in what way we can think of making it cost effective and still even if there are many components being printed there are some challenges still there which again with the help of um, these computer assisted either the CAD, uh, the modeling simulations 
topology optimization. So you can see with the help of those things, we can actually, um, instead of going for trial and error, we can uh, have those analysis and we can come up with better quality and accuracy. So from this, what we can understand, whether it is a CNC or it's a 3D printer. So the very first thing what we want as a starting part is CAD. So CAD is something that is like, uh, like immaterial for uh, most of the things, whatever we are doing nowadays, whether it's a simulation, whether it's a CNC uh, turning, if you see here, if it is an assembly. So there, like you make different components and you see after uh, you, uh, so these are, when you are in a design phase, CAD is equally important because you are thinking of a particular final product, you make different components, sub components, you try to assemble it and see how the uh, overall uh, product is. Uh, so in that way, if you want to do any changes, again, you have the flexibility to do the changes and see if uh, this is not the way it has to be assembled. So uh, CAD is something which is like it has become an indispensable part in mechanical engineering. So uh, one is assembly. Then we have uh, analysis, FEM analysis. So whether it is uh, a, like a very, uh, like here it is a bridge or what I said in the previous slide about 3D printing. So if you want to simulate and do uh, understand where the residual stresses are, how to reduce it, how to reduce porosity. So the first thing for any analysis, for any simulations, we require a CAD model. Similarly for CFD, also we require a CAD model. Inspections, so like we have coordinate measuring machines. So that are again, so in those CMMs also the input or the starting part is basically a CAD model, a CAD geometry, so the geometry by CAD. So CNC tool path that we already saw. So in that also we require a CAD model. Topolo topology optimization, which I was just telling in 3D printing. So for that also you require a CAD model. So you have a starting model like this, and then you want to go for different topology optimization. So once this topology optimization is done, you do the analysis. And once your design is final, you can actually uh, take that and 3D print it. So that is how you can see all these things are connected. And the first thing which is required for most of the things is CAD. So that is how CAD is very, very important. So these are some of the softwares just uh, for your uh, uh, like uh, uh, just for the knowledge, like these are some of the softwares. I think uh, you must be also teaching your students uh, SolidWorks or uh, Creo. So there are uh, some of the softwares, SolidWorks and Creo, Fusion 360. These are all commonly used uh, uh, softwares, which we uh, already know. And apart from that, we have some open source kind of thing also, like FreeCAD, OpenCasket. And, um, and for related to this uh, CAD, there are a lot of softwares available, a lot of materials available. So we, at least as a mechanical engineer, at least one or two of these softwares we should know. Because what we can see is whether it's a handling a CNC machine or you want to work on 3D printing or you just want to do some simulations or analysis, the first thing is about CAD model. So CAD model is something which is the first thing we have to know. So apart from that, we can also go for some uh, graph. We should uh, also learn something about these uh, graphic designs. So basically, CAD is something what uh, I want to say is one of the important starting point for most of the things, whatever we are doing in our current uh, era. So next is uh, simulations. So now one, one is the starting part is CAD and simulations. Again, simulation, it's a very generalized thing. Uh, simulations, why we go for simulations like uh, these finite element simulations, because it helps us in reducing the number of experiments, simply going on for uh, trial and error methods and then coming back, okay, there is a defect here, there is a problem here. So instead of that, we can actually go, uh, uh, go for the simulations and we do the analysis, check what the problem is. Again, you do a lot of um, a uh, lot of changes, uh, you keep on changing the parameters and see in which particular thing, whatever the desired output you are targeting for, that you are getting. Once you have those results, you take it as a reference and then you actually fabricate. So experiments cannot be completely substituted, but with the help of simulations, we are able to reduce this drastically. So it not only just uh, uh, saves our time, it also saves uh, money and uh, material wastage as well. So in case of manufacturing, we have different kinds of simulations and analysis. It is like common for whatever things you are seeing. We can actually simulate. We can do the analysis and then go for the uh, fabrication. 
so there are different uh, like uh, if we see the may uh, the manufacturing processes primary processes like casting so in casting what we see is casting is a process where uh, it uh, you have to know about uh, where it involves heat transfer mass transfer and phase transformation also so there are different uh, now because of these powerful computers and there are different uh, softwares coming up so now there are some softwares these are completely dedicated to casting simulations also so where why we uh, use it so we basically starting from uh, uh, from the uh, where we can focus on the gating design so gating design is nothing but like how the material is being poured at what rate it is being poured and then how the solidification is happening what is what uh, what is the time of uh, time taken for solidification whether there is some defects like um, the rate at which you are pouring and the solidification is happening whether it is able to fill the entire mold cavity or not and uh, the um, uh, temperature distribution is proper or not and there are some defects so all these kinds of things we can actually uh, see with the help of casting simulations so these are some of the softwares like uh, procast flow 3d magma soft and um, autocast so there are a lot many softwares so these softwares uh, are completely uh, or dedicated for uh, casting so whatever things you want like temperature distribution what is the uh, flow and uh, what is the pressure distribution and what are the defects so all those things you can actually see and uh, you do some changes in the process parameters and again you see how the things are gating design so all these things can actually done and uh, virtually and you can simulate see the output in terms of defects temperature distribution and uh, the flow material flow and then you can decide on the uh, gating design so what uh, like in our uh, institute we have this uh, zcast like we have a program called uh, will for working professionals so there basically uh, for our manufacturing process course so we make use of this zcast simulation so where uh, so it's quite user friendly also because it's completely dedicated for casting so there will be different modules how to make the pattern how to make the mold and how to fix how to make this uh, different components whatever components you want to add in the gating system starting from uh, uh, the uh, runner riser uh, gates in gates so all those things you can actually make it and then you do the analysis and based on that you can actually uh, you can freeze your design so this is what is related to casting simulations similarly we have metal forming simulations because forming is also a very important application a lot of applications in automobiles and uh, day to day uh, whatever uh, things you are using lot of things are coming from uh, forming operations and uh, here again uh, we have different um, so in forming actually we have two uh, two types one is bulk deformation and another is sheet metal forming so for these two things we have different softwares for bulk deformation we have uh, uh softwares like uh, general uh, general finite element software like we have abacus we can make use of abacus or we have ls dyna so these are the softwares which can be used for bulk deformation where you can see how the material flow is what are the defects so how the material flow uh, what are the defects and uh, how the uh, the load um, how where the load is happening where there is a chance of uh, uh, failure so all those things can be analyzed and based on that we can actually uh freeze our die design and uh, what load should be given so all those things can actually be uh, decided based on these kind of simulations so here if you see the this is the actual component and this is the simulated one so this is how you can uh, come up with uh, this is the cross section cross section of the component so how these cracks have developed so obviously initially when you are going for simulations uh when you uh, develop a simulation model whether it is for casting or it is for forming or next what we have is uh, uh machining so no matter whatever simulation model you develop validation is surely required so initially under similar conditions you have to uh, go for the experimental uh, you have to do the experiment and then you have to validate once your model is validated then whatever process parameter changes you want to do hello yeah so whatever you want to do you can actually do it so this is how validation is a very important step in simulation so once validation is done you can simply uh, uh, play with different parameters and see how the output is coming so these are some of the softwares just wanted to show you these are the softwares deform it's a very popular software mainly for forming 
bulk deformation. Apart from that, we have Avdex and uh, Simufac, but Deform is a very popular uh, software and uh, quite easy to use also because here it is completely dedicated for forming operation. So if you just, uh, it's not like we cannot do the things in Abacus or LS Dyna. So, but those are all general purpose softwares where you have to start, uh, you have to do it completely model everything. But in Deform, since it's dedicated for bulk deformation, so like a uh, die design and there will be a lot of things already inbuilt. So there, uh, so it becomes more easy to use Deform for metal forming simulations. Otherwise, you can go for a general purpose software also like Abacus. So this is what is related to metal forming simulation. Again, we also have simulations uh, software related to sheet metal forming. We have LS Dyna, Abacus, Hyperform. So these softwares we generally use for sheet metal forming. Like if you want to see the deep drawing operation and uh, tube bending. So all uh, things related to sheet. So in that case, we can go for LS Dyna, Abacus, Hyperform, and uh, we can see the defects uh, where the uh, where there are chances of getting fractures. So those things can be taken up using these simulations. Then apart from that, we also have machining simulations. So the most commonly used softwares are Deform and Abacus, where you try to uh, simulate the chip formation process. In fact, my PhD was actually related to <laughs> simulations of uh, machining process. Uh, so these are all very uh, important things, like just going for trial and error. What we do is we simulate. So no matter what process or what manufacturing process you are simulating, so there are some important points. One thing is that you have to have a CAD model. And then you have to look into the boundary conditions. Uh, you have to first uh, identify your problem domain. And then you have to make a CAD model. And then you have to think of the boundary conditions. Material model is very important in manufacturing. Because here, uh, in manufacturing processes, here we also, not only the elastic properties are required, like in case of forming and machining, we also require the plastic properties. So material constitutive models are very important, what model you are choosing, and then uh, what are the process for it, parameters you are taking that you need to uh, input, and then uh, analysis of the outputs. So once some prediction is there, validation is very important. Once your model is validated, then you can make use for further predictions and analysis. But validation is one step which has to be done. Otherwise, there could be any results appearing. But we don't know whether those results are really useful or not. So we have to validate. We have to fine tune our process parameters. And then once the validation is done, we can use it for further analysis. So for welding also, we have um, uh, we can go for abacus. Apart from that, we have some specific uh, welding uh, softwares also like Simufact. Otherwise, Abacus is also one of the commonly used uh, um, software for welding simulations. So as I said, so this was related to simulations. I'll just try to sum it up. I think I have taken extra time. Uh, so as I said, uh, these are all related to what are the uh, current trends in mechanical engineering, especially related to computer. So automation, as I said, is one of the areas which is uh, surely there. And in our case, uh, why, uh, like, uh, it's not only about in uh, manufacturing, uh, automation is important. So because our country, agriculture, if I showed, initially I showed you the uh, statistics. So agriculture, agriculture is also one of the important areas. So now what is happening is we are losing many people. Uh, we, the manpower is reducing in agriculture. Uh, so if we are trying to, if we will automate this, obviously the efficiency will be increasing. So with lesser time, we can have uh, like a more uh, efficient uh, work can be done. But thing is that, again, here, uh, it's not like in foreign countries, agriculture is automated. But in our country, it's not that much common because the automation itself is very costly. So we here, this is one of the areas where we have to target for. We have to bring in cost-effective automa automated uh, equipments in the area of agriculture. So basically, we have to focus on developing those cost-effective um, equipments that can automate different processes in agriculture. In fact, sometimes if you see in CERB and DST, there will be specific calls for this, for developing these kind of uh, equipments related to agriculture, because this is something which is really required uh, in, uh, in our country, automation in agriculture. And uh, apart from that, uh, nowadays, if you see, lot of automation has happened in our day to day life also if uh, there could be lot of tracking kind of things from security purpose
like if the from now in most of the apartments having a fire alarm kind of thing that smoke detector smoke a smoke detector is something it is like uh, very much required so there are something mandatory it is becoming so automation in our day to day life is also becoming a part and parcel so industrial automation robots robot is one uh, very important thing that has come up like in our third and fourth industrial revolution in fact in the fourth so this uh, robots are very very important uh, so i am not going to take time in this because you have separate sessions on this only thing is that i am saying okay these are all part of this um, industrial revolution which is going on then we have uh, this in industry 4.0 iot is something like one of the buzzword internet of things so now in third revolution what we have done is we worked on automation we worked on digitization now thing is that how to do uh, everything how to it's now uh, mostly related to networking that internet has become a very uh, important element here so it's nothing but a cyber physical system being set up and uh, the tools which are very important sensors sensors are required and internet so what we are trying to do is there are different uh, equipments there are different sensors how they can communicate so it's something related to data exchange communication among different equipments and everything has to be done uh, on a cloud i mean because since so many data generation is happening so now we have to also think of where to store those data and if it is in cloud so then how to access that data and how to also protect that data so all these things are coming under this iot so cyber security is also very important so these are some of the areas which are coming up in iot uh, so uh, like sensor applications then how to do uh, how to um, store the data and then how to analyze that is data analytics cloud computing big data so all these words are actually related to iot because this is what is the current uh, need so for developing smart industries uh, smart factories so these are some of the things which are actually part of industry 4.0 apart from that we have biomedical i am not going to take time on this in biomedical also mecha engineering has uh, is uh, uh, playing a very important role so if you see uh, cad like computer there are a lot of machines in which computer is really required there are a lot of simulations initially being done and then the actual surgery is being taken so here in biomedical also application of these computers application of technology is very very important it has become a very uh, key element in biomedical applications so we do the simulations and then we actually do the actual surgery similarly micro manufacturing uh, here also uh, like uh, uh, micro manufacturing is one of the uh, current uh, trend if we see micro uh, related to biomedical applications also we have to uh think about uh, manufacturing uh, the uh, mic uh, the uh, components in microns so for that this is also area where uh, the, the cncs are coming into picture without that we cannot do it and then we also have augmented rea reality and virtual reality this is also something which is now uh, coming up so there are a lot of areas in which this can be explored starting from safety training inspection maintenance uh sometimes uh, doing these test drives of the car so there are a lot of uh, uh, things coming up in this area as well so basically uh, to conclude what i am saying is uh, looking at the current need that is the fourth industrial revolution so the buzzwords which are coming up is something like artificial intel intelligence machine learning deep learning how to uh, store the data how to analyze those data uh, this uh, how to connect Uh, from one equipment to another in the uh, so these are some of the things then uh, some related to control systems because automation robotics so for that you require the knowledge of control systems and also this um, uh, uh, and obviously the starting part is always uh, the cad cam knowledge of these things so this is what is the overall uh, thing related to uh, the current trends or the application of cad cam ca in uh, manufacturing so this is what is the uh, overview of uh, the applications of computers in mechanical engineering yeah thank you madam thank you very much yeah i took a uh, lot of extra time i'm really no issue sorry. madam no issue in yeah. fact uh, you have given a lot of information for us thank you very much for that um yeah. okay uh, let's have the questions from the participants participants if you are in, uh, if you are having any questions uh, the speaker can answer you now uh, 
Uh, okay, madam. In fact, I I am I am having one question now. Uh, you told about the 3D printing, right? In the metal 3D printing, uh, yeah. what about the strength of the um, component that we printed in the 3D printing? Right? Can it be comparable with the uh, conventional one? Uh, you are asking about metal components or? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that is what I said. I mean, one of the challenges still, uh, it's there related to strength because I showed the areas where we have still scope of improvement. So strength and uh, this porosity, these are some of the things. But yes, if we uh, if we if we do the op process optimization, and uh, if we go for the process parameter optimization, it depends upon like the generally for uh, the three D printing is mostly for getting some complex structures. So it depends upon the application. Let's say for some uh, making some scaffolds. Now, scaffold is something where it's not a load-bearing kind of uh, component. So in those cases where they want a very complex structure, lattice structured things. So in uh, so here, the application itself is altogether different. But what you said, that strength, if we compare with the conventional process, yes, it's still, it has to be improved. But if you look at different applications where it's not a very load-bearing kind of thing, and it is the strength is sufficient for whatever application it is meant, where the complex structure is more important, lattice structures. So in that way, the most uh, uh, the most uh, feasible method is to go for 3D printing instead of going for these machining operations where that much complex structures cannot be built. Okay, man. But what about the surface finish? How to address the surface finish? Yeah, that is why post finishing uh, uh, surface finish is again a, a thing. Uh, but if you see, uh, if we compare with, uh, there are again uh, techniques like very sophisticated, like BED and all. In that, because it's completely melting and getting deposited. So in that, surface finish is also improving. But generally, if you see, 3D printing has to be followed by a post-processing. So that is also an area, like how to go for post, uh, how to go for the finishing operations. Because when they are co complex structures, for these complex structures to get those uh, achievable finish, what should be the strategy for post finishing? Post finishing is something surely it is there. But Hello. with Hello. the improvement okay. in technique, we can surely improve. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, I'm Dr. Stocker from SNICT, madam. Uh, uh, there is a question. Hello. Yeah. Uh, this uh, 3D printed components. Uh, in order to increase the strength or some uh, particular kind of property, it can uh, undergo some kind of heat treatment or some other process just yes. to improve the uh, some desired uh, property. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. That is what is post because if you see, I showed post processing also. Generally, after three D printing, there has to be post processing. So it could be in terms of heat treatment also. It could be in terms of some finishing operation. Okay. Okay, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, then. Okay, madam. It seems uh, no other person is having any doubts. And okay. I must thank you, really. You have uh, put a lot of effort. Because uh, by looking at all the slides and by looking at the content of the slides, definitely I can say that you have spent almost uh, <laughs> more than uh, five or six hours for uh, giving us one hour. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, I mean, there was a lot of content. And keeping in mind, OK, I have to finish in one hour. I don't know whether I did proper justification to the session <laughs> or not. Because it I was thinking well. I have to finish it in one hour. So yes, I hope well, at least well, yes. overview was given to that. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. for. Thank you, sir. I thank you, sir, for giving me the part. opportunity to be a yeah, part of you. this session. Yeah, we should thank you, madam, in fact, for uh, okay. giving us such a wonderful presentation. Thank you, madam. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.